All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Kemp. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is a juicy one with some deep esoteric knowledge. Get ready for episode 115, as today I will be revealing the function of the ancient concentric stone circle system, Stonehenge, and why this structure was known as the Dance of the Giants. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization, utilizing chemistry and physics, and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, this is the channel for you. So please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube, and don't forget to click that little notification bell so that you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. Check out the Land of Chem members only section for exclusive research and unreleased footage, and thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, please go subscribe to our two new channels here on YouTube Egyptian Trash Cats and Egypt Eats. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that's it for the intro, so without further ado, Let's get right to it. And just a quick reminder, for anyone that's interested in coming to Egypt to see the pyramids for yourself, the Land of Chem 2024 Ancient Alchemy and Ascension Tour is on and bookings are still available. If you want to join the group, please send me an email to contact at thelandofchem.com with the subject line 2024 Egypt Tour, and I will send you the full tour itinerary and pricing details. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you soon here in Egypt. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. And to begin, here is a diagram of Stonehenge showing the extreme complexity of the site and its components, starting with the external reservoir here, a system of two station stones here and here, and two mound structures, the North Barrow here and the South Barrow here, both with their own reservoirs located within the external depression. Next, you can see the causeway leading toward the structure from the river here, featuring a series of stones known as the heel stone here and the slaughter stones here. Next, moving toward the inner concentric circle system. There are two rings of post holes here and here that once held wooden beams or other smaller stones similar to those of the wood henge structure. Here we have one central ring that are known as the sarsen stones composed of siliceous high silica content sandstone. Here a horseshoe shaped arrangement of trilithon stones, an inner horseshoe of what are known as blue stones that also feature an immense monolith known as the altar stone. So this is a very complicated ancient structure featuring a variety of components, all made from an impressive array of materials with different functions. Now, Here's a picture from my recent expedition to Stonehenge, showing the heel stone located in an area that was once the causeway leading into the concentric circle system. And you can still see the remains of the reservoir enclosure surrounding the Sarsen stone circle here. And after watching this episode, I highly recommend checking out the full footage in Sunday Site Visit 34. Next up, the geometry of the structure, as first described by William Stuckley in the 1700s, as shown in his depiction of Stonehenge here. And you can see the massive monolith altar stone here in the center. And he describes this complete system as, quote unquote, the cell. 
which encodes esoteric alchemical knowledge that was far beyond its time, as Stonehenge is indeed a cell, or rather, a capacitor for the storage of electric fields. Here is another image showing the same geometry discovered by William Stuckley. Now, this one in particular caught my attention. And for any of you that are practitioners of ceremonial magic, you might recognize this symbol here in the center as well as being the unicursal hexagram, a symbol that was adopted by none other than the likes of Aleister Crowley, the Golden Dawn, and the followers of the Lemma. Now, back to our dielectric capacitor stone circle system in the storage and distribution of electric fields. First, let me read the following from the paper that I've referenced previously, Telluric and Earth Currents, Lightning Strike Locations, and Natural Resource Exploration, starting here. With the fact that there are up to 25% more lightning strikes at high lunar tide when compared to the number of lightning strikes at low lunar tide. As the moon goes around the earth, its gravity not only raises the oceans, it also raises the ground. This earth tide is much smaller than the ocean tides. However, it appears to have a significant impact on earth currents, otherwise known as telluric currents. The sun causes about a third as much of the earth tide as the moon does. So the earth tides need to be calculated using both the position of the moon and of the sun. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is why Stonehenge is configured as an astronomical observatory that is specifically calibrated to track the movements of both the moon and the sun, as you can see depicted here. And this structure allowed them to accurately predict when naturally occurring lightning strikes were most likely to occur, independent of those produced by the White Horse Wiltshire Hill cumulonimbus cloud generating systems. And you can see here that they were tracking major and minor moonrise and moon set, along with summer and winter solstice sunrise and sunset. And as shown in the research data, the moon has a powerful effect on the frequency of lightning, especially during the new and full moon, which you can see here and here, which were calculated and tracked within Stonehenge in the major moonrise and moonset alignments, a time period that produces the most significant earth tides and thus the most lightning. Stated here, quote, at the new and full moon, the sun and the moon are aligned and the lunar and the solar tidal maxima and minima, i.e. the bulges and depressions, add together for the greatest tidal range at particular latitudes. Now, additional research has shown that the tidal forces themselves may not be what cause the lightning, but rather the interaction between the sun, the moon, and the Earth's geomagnetic fields. Presented here in this paper entitled Moon Effect on Lightning. First, studies found an increase in the thunderstorm activity two days after full moon and attributed it to the lunar modulation of Earth's magnetic field in the geomagnetic tail and or an unknown effect on the lower atmosphere caused by the aligning of sun, earth, and moon. Next, they also found an increase in lightning activity in the new phase of the moon, not observed in the thunderstorm data and less pronounced than the decrease in the quarter moon. The lack of symmetric result with respect to the moon suggests that the effect is probably not due to gravitational tides, but may be related to moon's interaction with the Earth's magnetic field or otherwise unknown effect, which to me 
makes the incredibly sophisticated knowledge of the physics of our solar system encoded within this structure even more impressive. But tracking of these alignments and the timing of lightning occurrence isn't the only function of Stonehenge. Surely they didn't need to build an immense structure out of colossal pieces of unique types of stone just to track the sun and the moon. There had to be a secondary application for the stone materials that were used in this system, all of which happen to be dielectric materials. And I am proposing that Stonehenge was also designed to provide a target for lightning strikes and to harness and distribute these electric fields. And I recently revealed the same function for the Avebury Stone Circle Complex in Episode 6 on the Members Only Channel. A structure that features two inner stone circles that were also designed to track both the sun, as you can see here in red, and the maximum full moon, which you can see here in blue. And remember back in episode 103, when I explained the geometry of both magnetic and dielectric fields, specifically the radiating concentric circles of the magnetic field and the radial straight lines of the dielectric field emanating from a central conductor, as shown here from Charles Proteus Steinmetz on the left. Well, these are directly applicable to both Avebury, as you can see here, and Stonehenge, as you can see here. And I will briefly summarize the operation of this system, which is all made from dielectric stone materials with the capacity for storing electric fields. Starting with capturing the electric field from telluric currents within the stones on the surface of the ground shown here in red. This positively charged field provides a target for the instantaneous discharge of negatively charged ions within the white horse cumulonimbus cloud in the form of a lightning bolt that will seek the shortest path to ground at the location with the most significant differences of these charges caused by the Earth's telluric currents, which in this case would be the altar stone. And I believe this stone was once erect and the tallest stone of this entire system. And I will note here of great importance to this proposition that the altar stone is completely different from all of the other stones used at Stonehenge. It is not high content silica siliceous sandstone, but rather high mica content micaceous stone. And mica, as quoted here, Electrically speaking, mica is fireproof and has the unique combination of high dielectric strength, endurance, uniform dielectric constant, low dielectric loss, high electric resistivity, and superior insulating properties. And when lightning struck this altar stone, it would undergo a process known as dielectric breakdown which spontaneously transforms the material into an electrical conductor. And as I just showed in the diagram of an electric current passing through a central conductor, the electric field will radiate out in radial lines that are shown here in yellow. And I highly recommend checking out episode six regarding the function of the entire Avebury Serpent Temple complex on the members only channel as this is just the tip of the iceberg of how these complete systems operate. But to recap, Stonehenge is a dielectric capacitor system designed to store electric fields, which attract lightning, and then distribute the electric fields throughout various other components of these stone circle and passage chamber mound complexes. But that's not all, ladies and gentlemen. I also explained in Members Only Channel Episode 6 the connections between the Avebury Serpent Temple Complex and the symbolism of the Mesoamerican deity Kukul Khan, known as the Feathered Serpent, as related to the Serpent Shadow Equinox Celebration at the Pyramid of Chichen Itza. 
I also showed how this plumed serpent symbolism was associated with the planet Venus, the movements of which were also being tracked in an astronomical observatory located at this site. Well, it just so happens that Stonehenge was also designed to track the planet Venus. As you can see here in this diagram on the left from Richard Heath at sacrednumbersciences.org showing the inverted pentagram, an ancient symbol for the planet Venus encoded within the horseshoe ring of Trilithon stones at Stonehenge, which predicts the maxima of Venus. And here on the right, the inner and outer ring of blue stones, encoding both the solar year and the Venus eight year synod, along with its conjunctions between the sun, earth, and moon. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why Stonehenge is also known as the dance of the giants, not because it was built by giants, but because it tracks and predicts the spectacular coordination of these celestial events. As you can see here, once again, the inverted pentagram indicating conjunctions between Venus, the sun, and the earth. And here, this gorgeous geometric pattern known as the Rose of Venus, otherwise called the Dance of Venus, showing the pattern created by the planet Venus in its eight-year synodic transit. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Dance of the Giants, encoded and tracked within the Stonehenge Circle. And perhaps the ancients knew something that we don't about the effect of Venus, Sun, and moon conjunctions on the Earth's geomagnetic field and thus lightning events. And this astronomical calendar prepared them for these events. The bearing of this worshiped and feared lightning falling from the heavens down upon the Earth. And only those initiates of the highest order will understand this connection between Venus and the symbolism of light falling from heaven down to Earth. Or as we know it today, the immensely powerful electrostatic discharge from a lightning bolt. And the following mystery is something I cannot explain to you as it must be pursued of your own free will. Because Venus, that you can see here, aligned with both Mercury and the moon, and depicted here on the right as showering down light from heaven, the light bearer, lightning, was also referred to in the ancient times as... All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 115, The Function of Stonehenge. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in this week's Sunday site visit, the breathtaking footage from our expedition to Caro Keel and our nighttime visit to Queen Maeve's car. This is an episode you do not want to miss. So if you haven't already, Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube if you're interested in the ancient technology of a lost civilization, utilizing physics and chemistry, and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world. If you want to help support the channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section. This month's video, the exclusive unreleased footage from my expedition to Kassar El Saga, the Palace of the Goldsmith. TheLandofChem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch. Follow me on Instagram at The Land of Chem. Don't forget to go check out our two new channels here on YouTube, Egyptian Trash Cats and Egypt Eats. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, <laughs> thank you all so much for the support. I think that's it for today's episode. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.